This slide's presentation will cover cerebellar pathophysiology and management. Essentially, you can get cerebellar dysfunction in a number of different ways, and the first is going to be acquired. Okay, you can acquire a cerebellar problem through a stroke, whether that be an ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. It could be through a tumor, where the tumor is primarily, it started where the tumor actually started growing in the cerebellum, and that would be considered a primary tumor, or it may be a metastasis from somewhere like the lung that ended up in the cerebellum. You can have a toxicity cerebellar dysfunction that's due to alcohol or drugs. You can acquire cerebellar problems through TBI and infection and immune mediated processes such as multiple sclerosis and even gluten ataxia. Okay, this is just a sensitivity to gluten that results in ataxia. And finally, hypothyroidism will, is also an endocrine method for developing cerebellar dysfunction. Another way that you can get cerebellar dysfunction is through heredity. Okay, there's, uh, you can inherit something known as spinocerebellar ataxia. And there are multiple different types of spinocerebellar ataxia, but you should remember that this SCA is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. Now the picture on the right-hand side shows an MRI, two MRIs there. The, the one to the farthest right shows a circle over the area of a normal cerebellum. And then the one that's uh, uh, juxtaposed to that there's uh, a circle over the area of the cerebellum with, of a person with spinocerebellar ataxia. And you can see that the person with SCA has a much atrophied cerebellum. Typical patient signs and symptoms are gonna be anything that you'd associate with cerebellum dysfunction, uh, specifically ataxia, gait disturbances, dysarthria, um, that sort of thing. Okay, another way you can inherit cerebellar dysfunction is in an autosomal recessive manner. And Friedrich's ataxia is an example of this kind of problem. And you can see from the and Friedrich's ataxia is an example of this kind of problem. And you can see from the picture on the right-hand side of the slide that this patient population has something known as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or just an enlarged heart. They present with dysarthria, typically diabetes, and very well known for scoliosis, areflexia, a significant ataxia with their gait and in standing, as well as pes cavus. Another autosomal recessive manner for acquiring cerebellar dysfunction is called episodic ataxia. Okay, you can inherit episodic ataxia, and it's nothing more than what it what sounds. Um, your ataxia comes and goes. Okay, it's not consistently there all the time. Uh, sometimes it will be there, and other times it will not. So, hereditary. Autosomal dominant, spinal cerebellar ataxia, autosomal recessive, or Friedrich's ataxia and episodic ataxia. And then finally, um, there's also the degenerative non hereditary cerebellar dysfunction. Example of this would be multiple system atrophy or MSA. And if you remember the, the MSA disorder, that, that's something that we talked about when we covered Parkinson's, and this is one of those Parkinson's plus disorders. Okay, the patient's going to present with autonomic dysfunction, as well as if you look at the, the triangle, the left-hand side of the triangle, that person has the, the typical par Parkinsonian flexed posture. And in addition, MSI is also known for cerebellar disease or associated ataxia. Cerebellar disorders, if you remember way back to the fall semester when we talked about the movement system diagnoses, these types of disorders are considered hypermetria. 
And that means nothing more than the inability to grade forces appropriately for whatever the task is. And it has to do with speed or distance of the task. Um, person might present with overshooting or undershooting a target or any kind of dystiatocokinesia, which we've covered before. When you're watching this patient population uh, do a task, uh, you can look at gait and you might see variable foot placement during gait whether that's a compensatory wide base of support to maintain their balance or even a, a scissoring gait due to lack of control of, of limb placement. You may also see a tremor with reaching activities, and this is going to be specifically an intention tremor. Okay, that tremor won't be present at rest. It's only going to be present when they're doing something. There are multiple signs of cerebellar dysfunction, and these are listed on, on this slide. Um, previously, we've talked about dysmetria, dystiatocokinesia. Uh, a new word here is dyssynergia, and that's going to be uncoordinated multi-joint movement. An example of that is if during a reaching activity, if the person has to flex their shoulder as well as extend their elbow to reach an object, um, this is going to appear very not coordinated, okay? Um, as far as a compensation for dyssynergia that patients might display, this is known as decomposition. And decomposition is nothing more than breaking down that multi-joint multi movement to allow completion of the task. Um, and the example of, of reaching for an object that might look like having the patient perform shoulder flexion first, and then elbow extension during the reaching, so that they've isolated the, the two different components and are able to complete the task. It's a compensation. It's called decomposition. Okay, next there's something called lack of check or the rebound test. And um, this video, I'll just go ahead and play it for you, shows the performance of the rebound test. The Holmes rebound test is going to be done for both cerebellar and proprioceptive problems. I'm gonna have you bring your arm up like this, and I'm gonna pull down on the arm, and then I'm gonna let go of the arm, and when I do, I want you to try to maintain it in that position. Now with your eyes open, I want you to pull, give me some resistance. Good, okay, now, I want you to close your eyes, and we're gonna do the same thing. Pull real hard, real hard, good. Okay, here with this video, you're seeing the results of a normal test. This is a negative test. A positive test um, would look like that patient was not able to maintain their elbow on approximately 90 degrees of flexion. They would flex all the way um, down and, and possibly touch their shoulder or hit their face during the presence of the test. Okay, there's also intention tremor. We've talked about that previously. Hypotonia, this patient population tends to be very low tone. They typically will present with gait ataxia, uh, whether that's limb ataxia, the, depending on where the, the location of the lesion is, or it's going, it could be also truncal ataxia. They're going to have ocular motor deficits and concomitant vestibular deficits that go along with that because of the association of the vestibular nucleus with the cerebellum. They may present with speech impairments. And really important to know when um, trying to manage this patient population is they have impaired motor learning. If you remember, the cerebellum is really involved and stores motor programs. Okay, this is going to be that, that psychomotor storage area. So if a person isn't able to, to learn properly because they don't, their cerebellum isn't functioning properly. Okay. Thinking about cerebellar dysfunction and the signs for cerebellar dysfunction, I hope you remember that if somebody has a problem on the right side of their cerebellum, these issues are going to present on the right side of their body. Okay, so it's not crossed over to the other side, it's same side problems. The Holmes rebound test is going to One thing that's, that's handy that we talked a little bit about in vestibular is you can diagnose or differentially diagnose a cerebellar or brain stem stroke from a vestibular disorder. This is done through a test that's known as HINTS. 
And HINTS is nothing more than an acronym that stands for Head Impulse Test, nystagmus that is direction changing. We've talked about that previously as being a central sign and a positive test of skew. Okay, if the head impulse test is positive, you're thinking peripheral vestibular function, or I hope you're thinking peripheral vestibular dysfunction. But if that head impulse test is negative and you have the presence of nystagmus, positive test there, and a positive test of skew, this has a high positive predictive value for either a cerebellar or a brainstem stroke. Okay, it is 100% sensitive. This is a really good screening test and 96% specific for cerebellar or brainstem stroke. Um, it's actually better than an MRI. Okay, so just information. You could also differentially diagnose cerebellar disorder from somatosensory ataxia. And with somatosensory ataxia, I'm specifically talking about a loss of proprioception due to damage to the, of the DCML tract, okay, anywhere in the DCML pathway, um, and specifically the dorsal columns. Okay, an example of a, of a disease that, that is uh, commonly associated with somatosensory ataxia is going to be syphilis, late, later stage syphilis. And what I've done here is I've, I've drawn up a table on the left-hand side, you can see signs and symptoms associated with cerebellar dysfunction. And on the right-hand side of the table, you see signs and symptoms associated with somatosensory dysfunction. Those that I've highlighted in green are common to both. So, for example, I would expect ataxic gait pattern, decomposition of movement, rebound phenomena, dysmetria, dystidocokinesia, intention tremor, and balance and equilibrium impairment in both individuals that have cerebellar dysfunction and somatosensory ataxia. Okay, those things that are highlighted in yellow are going to be different between the two. So we know that vestibular is associated with cerebellar disorders. Um, dizziness or vestibular impairment is going to be something that you find in an individual with a cerebellar problem. Somatosensory ataxia, you would expect no dizziness. Okay, cerebellar disorder, typically low tone, Somatosensory, the muscle tone can vary. Asthenia, and that, that's a new word. So asthenia is, is a kind of um, fatigue and or weakness that's associated with the presence of a cerebellar disorder. It's going to be positive with cerebellar. It's going to vary with somatosensory. And all the way down, if you look at gaze evoked nystagmus, remember that direction changing gaze evoked nystagmus is going to be positive in a cerebellar disorder. There should be no gaze evoked nystagmus with a somatosensory ataxia. <clears throat> you would expect no conscious proprioception loss. Remember, the cerebellum is associated with non conscious proprioception. No conscious proprioception loss with cerebellar, but a definite proprioception loss with somatosensory ataxia. There's going to be a negative Romberg test with the cerebellar disorder, positive Romberg test with the somatosensory disorder. And the Romberg test, again, is just feet together, eyes open, and eyes closed, trying to maintain balance. Okay, in the absence of the vision, when you don't have that proprioception, that test is, is going to be positive. And another new word here is titubation. So titubation is nothing more than like a jerk of your head and or trunk. And this is going to be associated with a cerebellar disorder where you're not going to see any, any titubation with the somatosensory ataxia disorder. So you can easily distinguish the cerebellar and brainstem strokes from vestibular disorder, as well as cerebellar dysfunction from somatosensory ataxia. You should know that following a cerebellectomy, uh, the patient's prognosis is going to be poor. Okay? If both sides of the cerebellum were affected, then that is going to be a worse prognosis than if only one side of the cerebellum was affected. An example of that would be uh, a person who had a cerebellar stroke. If both sides of the cerebellum, if it's bilateral stroke, that's going to be much worse, or a much worse prognosis than if only one side of the cerebellum was affected. 
And the bilateral cerebellar strokes are going to be the individuals that are very difficult to mobilize, especially early on, because they're going to be so dizzy and, and nauseous. They're going to be vomiting. It's really difficult to get them out of bed. If the person has an issue with the deep cerebellar nuclei, remember vestigial interposed or dentate nucleus, their prognosis is going to be much worse than if the problem were in the cortical region alone. And anyone with an acquired cerebellar disorder, the most spontaneous compensation is going to be complete in six months to one year. When you're examining a patient with cerebellar disorder, um, you're, you're really looking for their skill and efficiency of movement during any kind of functional task. You're looking for timing, sequence, accuracy, uh, initiation, control, and termination of movement in any functional activity or task, whether it be gait or even testing for dystiatocokinesia or, or a reaching task. Um, it's, it's just that simple. You're looking for their inability to perform a task smoothly. As far as treatment is concerned, as I mentioned previously, these individuals have difficulty with motor learning. Okay? If, if they have difficulty with motor learning, then in order to get them to function more normally, we really need to perform lots and lots of repetitions. And since they have trouble with motor learning, they're not able to generalize. So for example, they're, for them, getting out of a, a lower surface chair is very, very different than getting out of a higher surface chair. Even though we would think it's, it's very similar, they, they can't make that generalization. To them, low surface chair is a different activity or a different task than a high surface chair completely. So you really have to vary all kinds of task constraints and you know, for this, you really want to make sure that you understand what the person wants to do and has to do to function in their daily environment and make sure you practice that exact task. You also want to use some um, variable environmental constraints. So, for example, it might be good to practice walking over gravel um, or just straight concrete or even sand or grass. Um, if those are things the individual has to do, then you need to practice that thing by varying the environment. It's going to be really important to work on core stability, any kind of proximal stability activity. So, for example, starting the person in um, quadruped would be great. Uh, using any kind of developmental sequence, so going from quadruped to tall kneeling to half kneeling um, before you actually go into standing, uh, working on crawling, that sort of thing. So you're working on control of your proximal musculature, and by, by having all four extremities uh, have a, as a base of support, you can decrease the degrees of freedom, work on that proximal control before you ask that person to work on disc, distal control. Okay, there's a, a bunch of different um, exercises and these are known as Frankel's exercises. Okay, I put a link to Frankel's exercises in here for you to check out. And let's take a quick look at them. Okay, here are Frankel's exercises. This is just a PDF of the exercises. And they're just to get the patient to work on coordination. They're not strengthening. Um, they should be done very slowly, very evenly, and very accurately, as accurately as possible. You're not going for speed. You're going for accuracy of movement. And you want to avoid fatigue as much as possible. Essentially, you're going to start exercises lying down and you just follow the exercises in order with your patient. Um, really, really has been shown to, to help individuals that lack coordination or have significant ataxia. So reduce degrees of freedom, start lying down, and um, they're going to start just learning to control their extremities. Okay, and then you progress to exercises in sitting um, once the patient is able to do lying down exercises, then progress them to sitting, work on the exercises in order. Uh, when they get that sequence down, then you can work on exercises in standing. And then finally, just a, a few more cues for, for treatment of this patient population. Um, when possible, it, it's a good idea to use visual cues for placement. Then um, if they can visualize or if they have a target, 
uh, that, that's going to help them tremendously. So things to use would be a mirror, as you can see on the right hand side of the slide, so that they can see themselves performing a task, and also tape marks. It might be a good idea to put tape marks on the floor to give them a target to shoot for with their lower extremity door and gate. As I mentioned previously, it's going to require many, many repetitions on a variety of surfaces. Obstacle courses are always a great idea as long as you're safe. Uh, and this is going to be a patient population where I'm going to prefer to choose an assistive device to compensate for balance deficits, especially if that person's prognosis for recovery is poor, which we've talked about previously. In this case, I'm going to prefer to use a rolling walker versus a cane to, to give them that extra stability that they need, especially if they have that, that trunk tremor or trunk, truncal ataxia. It's going to really help their balance and improve their safety. And then finally, one last point is that something that people used to use, it's more old school than anything, it's become very controversial, is using weights. And if you add ankle weights or, or wrist weights to the person, uh, you can use weighted utensils or tools for feeding. It's going to provide a temporary reduction of their dysmetria and tremor. However, research has found that when you take the weights away, the dysmetria is actually worse. Uh, if nothing else, you're, you're trying to dampen the extra motion that's involved in this patient population, but you're doing nothing more than strengthening those muscles and they have extra motion after you remove the weights.